Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I think we've got a few more people filtering in, um, but we've got a good, uh, good group here at the moment. So thank you all for, uh, for joining us. The first thing for me to do is to say welcome to all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining this, our second webinar of the Accelerator 2019 applicant process. Um, this is the bit where we try and open up our process as far as we can so that there are no mysteries uh, behind what we do. We want you to be armed with all of the uh, uh, all of the inside knowledge that you need to be able to build a really, really strong application that not only is helpful, obviously, for the Imagine H2O's process, but also in your own business planning. The second of those is far more important important to me. It's the stuff that's, that really outlives the Imagine H2O process that can go on to inform the way in which you want to build your business. Um, so just before we get on to the uh, um, description of uh, kind of quickly what we do, because there isn't a 100% lineup between people who are on the last one and people who are on this one, so I'm quickly going to go through the introduction. So apologies if you saw it last time. Hopefully it will be helpful to see it again. Uh, my name is Tom Ferguson. I run the uh, Accelerator at Imagine H2O. I'm the VP of Programming. Um, and really that means that I am in charge of the experience of that all of the companies go through when they come into the Imagine H2O Accelerator. But this time of year is great for me because I am also in charge of the time when we get to help as many companies as possible um, inform the way in which they are thinking about their business to make it as strong as possible regardless of whether or not they get into the Accelerator. So that's what, really what this is all all about. What we're going to do today is that we are going to um, have a look at a little bit about what we think, uh, some guidelines about actually writing the application itself, and then the bit that I think will be really helpful, which is going inside the judging process um, to have a look at um, uh, exactly what the judges are going to be asked to assess your applications on. So you essentially are, oops, um, essentially are. Uh, looking at it. So, Victor, I can see that you've got a question here. Um, hello, I'm online and can't see you online, Tom. You should be just able to hear my voice. If there are any problems with that, then that's fine. We uh, choose not to use the um, uh, we choose not to use the uh, the video function um, because of some uh, um, uh, the quality of some connections, especially in uh, com for companies in emerging markets. So, if you can't see me, then that's fine. Um, uh, questions as we go through, just as Victor has done, please put them into the question box on the uh, GoToWebinar interface. Um, I will pause at various um, times throughout the presentation to answer uh, questions. Um, I'll, I'll try and hold as many as I can kind of to the end so we can get through all of them. Um, uh, and then, uh, but otherwise, you know, as, as things comes up, please do put them into the GoToWebinar uh, interface. A couple of other things to um, uh, remind you of, we will be posting extra one-to-ones. Now, I don't know when that is going to be, um, but we are pretty much booked up for the uh, one-to-ones, certainly on the, uh, the 17th and the 26th, I think. Uh, still a couple of lot of slots um, open on the last day of the one-to-ones, but we are gonna open a, uh, a couple more sessions there. So if you haven't been able to get one, um, then don't worry, you'll still be able to, uh, to, to get those. Um, we had a question last time, which is a really good idea. Um, posting an excellent application and an excellent video and an excellent slide deck. Um, they may not all be from the same application. Um, I have to get confirmation from the entrepreneur in question, um, but overall, yes, uh, we'll find a, we'll, we'll figure out a, uh, a way of, uh, of doing that. Um, and the last thing I want to say is if there are any ongoing questions, please email me. Um, question from Igor Martin, how many applicants do we expect? Um, we think it's going to be broadly in line with last year where we had 200 105 pre-applications of which we invited 127 uh, to apply in full. Um, it may be slightly more than that, it may be slightly less than that, but we think that's broadly where we're going to end up. Um, so it's competitive, but very much doable. Um, so, just uh, getting on to the, the meat of the presentation, so just as a reminder, we are a non-profit organization with the mission to empower people to develop and deploy innovation to solve water challenges globally. Um, and really what we are trying to do here is build an impact engine. So we see you as entrepreneurs, as change agents within the water world. You are the people who are going to be able to make mean a meaningful difference across the zillions of different problems that we have in the water sector. We want to work with you so that we have 
have you know each year 12 entrepreneurs working in parallel to make progress against water's thorniest issues and as we do our job in the accelerator plugging you into a network making sure that you're visible increasing your ability to make good entrepreneurial decisions you get more effective at what you're doing so you have a better sales pipeline you get your money raised faster etc etc you can build your team faster and that allows you to go out and have your ecosystem impact faster through us than you would be able to on your own so that's the three-stage impact engine that we go for and we think that it works um you know it's not it's not a perfect indicator um but the uh, imagination World companies have raised 340 million plus in aggregate um uh, since we started in 2009 and in 2017 um this says a little bit more about the denominator than it does the numerator but 30 percent of early stage investment in the wa uh, water sector came went to imagination World companies in 2017 that's from data from the clean tech group um, so our track record, um, one question we had last time is, you know, are, are, are we going to be useful in the consumer side or the agriculture side? We have worked with companies all over the show. Um, so we have uh, networks and, um, uh, and entrepreneurs that have been there and done that in all of the verticals that you, uh, um, that you are likely to be working, uh, working in. Um, and so we really do have a, a, a broad um, swathe of swathe of experience um, that we can bring to bear to help entrepreneurs from any part of the water um, uh, of the water sector. And so in 2018, as I said, 206 pre-applications, 127 applied in full, and then 12 companies were selected, and they've raised 43 million this year. And these are those companies. They are excellent. Um, uh, they will be a lot of them will be involved in some respect next year. I'm hoping you'll be able to meet um, some, if not all of them, for those of you who are selected for SF Week, and for those of you who choose to come to SF Week, even though you may not be part of the accelerator. Um, and really, they are such a fun bunch. Really, a uh, really great crew. Um, and I promise you, if they can do it, so can you a lot of these people really took a lot of coaching to get their um, applications up to scratch but once they were there they really had done a great job and it stood them in great stead this year to get them to where they need to be everybody is very healthy indeed so the accelerator what we're looking to do is create an unfair advantage so we are running from January to October um, uh, running capacity development um, uh, which is basically on uh, improving your entrepreneurial decision making so helping you make good entrepreneurial decisions but crucially helping you avoid making bad entrepreneurial decisions we will do that partially through uh, attaching you to uh, mentors. So we have four uh, mentors per company that come in over the course of the 10 months. Um, uh, then we'll work very, very hard, of you, or hard with you, the team at Imagine H2O will work very, very hard with you on your, specifically your investor pitch, but also your customer pitch, as well as your kind of Sendy deck, the, sim the simpler deck, um, and then the blurb that you will put into emails, um, one pages, everything that really outlines exactly what you're doing as a company. All of that is gonna be tightened up. Um, and then secondly, marketing and visibility. We give you a platform to be able to shout louder into the market with us than you would be able to on your own. So we have, whatever, 10,500 uh, Twitter followers. We have many thousands on LinkedIn and Facebook, um, a burgeoning but light, much lighter presence on uh, on Instagram. But really what counts, I think, is, our, is, is the fact that pretty much everybody in the water sector, certainly in the US, increasingly abroad, looks to us to see what's happening in terms of what's exciting in the um, in the world of uh, water innovation. Um, and so we really give you that platform, um, you know, the stamp of approval that comes from going through such a, you know, a tough process with tough judges that every, are very well respected within the uh, within the water sector. Um, and then that extends to in-person meetings. We just took uh, seven, well, we had 14 companies on the floor, but seven companies to the Innovation Pavilion at WevTech. Um, and we will also have reserved spaces at ACE for you, um, AWWA's conference, as well as kind of three to four other opportunities throughout the year for you to be able to be seen in person. Um, that covers a little bit of the customer introduction side of things. We have a network of, uh, it's actually, we've just done a, uh, a bit of a purge, so 61 uh, beta partners. Um, and then investor introductions, we have a network of about 250 investors um, that are sort of actively looking at uh, at water uh, deals. Just some stats here and three uh, testimonials from um, three of our fantastic entrepreneurs, two this year, one last year. Um, uh, they had a good time. If you want to speak to any of our um, uh, uh, alumni about the program, um, to be able to hear it from the horse's mouth, um, that should be possible. Just do let me uh, know. So 
Now onto the meat of what we are doing today. So the application process today is webinar two. Um, in 10 days is the deadline for the early bird. Um, so that's the, the discount on the application fee. If you have any questions about the application fee, please do let me know. I went through this in reasonable depth last year, um, uh, sorry, in, on the last webinar. But what we are doing is that we need to do this to be able to fund the software that we have that allows all applicants to be able to receive comments from the judges. That is a promise that we make to you, but there is no system out there that really allows it to be done well, so we build it ourselves uh, each year, and that costs us money. We are a, uh, as I say, we're a non-profit, we're backed by, um, uh, we're backed by uh, individual and um, corporate philanthropic capital, um, we are only five people in a room in San Francisco, we run very, very, very lean, um, and then the, the, but the second thing is that we're having that skin in the game really does improve outcomes. Um, it forces everybody to take it seriously. So hopefully that nominal fee uh, will not be a problem. I hope that's enough of an explanation because I do feel as if I owe it to you. Um, and then the final deadline is on November the 1st. Um, uh, please make sure you hit that. Um, it gets very difficult for us if you do not hit that because it's um, uh, unfair to the, the rest of the applicants. Um, and then we will finish up the pre-judging um, or the first round judging on November the 20th and then the full judges will have had their say by December the 12th and then we will have the announcement to the companies on December the 16th. Remember the one-on-ones, um, we will be posting uh, extra sessions. Um, interviews are going to happen from October the 29th to November the 8th. Um, uh, why this is happening before the final deadline, we will be able to understand You know the people who are uh, either you know on the fence or almost there uh, by that date, just given our given our numbers so far, um, and we will provide comments for all applications. So now writing the damn thing. So we're going to go through um, I come out I think seven or eight uh, pointers that are going to sort of seem obvious once we've seen them, but it's amazing how few people take notice of them. Um, I promise you, if you do these well, then you are going to be somewhere in the top 15% of applicants. I promise you that. Um, uh, it really, it, you know, this is uh, at the core of this is just doing the basics well. Um, and this is stuff that you probably, you know, heard when you were in kind of grade school. Um, I think you call it here uh, or, or primary and secondary school where I'm from. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, hopefully this doesn't seem too simple, um, but I don't think that there is any such thing. So, firstly, think and then write. There is a, there is a school of thought, um, the, I think it's a Joan Didion quote, which is, I don't know what I think until I start writing. Or I, or I write to know what I think. Um, and there is a lot of truth to that. I would apply that much more um, to, you know, obviously longer form writing, um, but certainly the blog side of things, I think it can be really, really, really helpful if you're trying to figure out, um, you know, what you think about uh, a given issue, whether it's your fundraising uh, side of things or, or what your kind of go-to-market plan is gonna be, whether or not that you should choose an investor uh, of any given type, etc. But for this, I really, what we see as a, a really good determinant of success is people who have planned out what they're going to be putting into the uh, answers beforehand, just because you are limited uh, very much by the, um, uh, by the character counts. Um, note that the character counts include spaces, and so if you are drafting offline, which I would definitely um, recommend that you do, um, before copying and pasting into the final, uh, before, but into the, the, the final application, remember to in, include the spaces. But Really think about what you want to communicate. What is going to be the kind of the, the written equivalent of a headbutt to the face of somebody um, who is looking at this just that just is going to think this is the most compelling thing possible. Now that can be to do with the size of the problem, the, the outcomes for the customer, um, your progress so far, what you found from your initial interviews, whatever it is, but make sure that you're really thinking about what's going to go in there. And then really think about what's insightful you know, what is going to be make people think, oh, God, that's interesting. This is not an area that I've thought of before, or at least I haven't thought of it in that way. And then what's the structure that you want to uh, put those that information in? Now, the good thing about um, this uh, application is that we have done the structure for you. Um, those little gray uh, bullet points that we have on the uh, application form, which you'll see again in just a second. But those little gray bullet points are your structure. Um, if you can follow those, then you're going to be in good shape. And so 
then the other thing is just draft, right? Is that try and do and do again and then keep on doing. And I would, you know, there's no reason why you can't be working on this, really sort of, um, you know, streamlining it up, um, updating uh, the application with data all the way up until midnight on November the 1st. All you have to do once you've got past the, um, uh, the application fee, once that's done, all you have to do is click save and we will see the latest version and we'll be able to see it in real time. Um, and then one other thing is that, you know, if you are looking at the, uh, the you know, the try and that you're looking for the feedback um obviously you know show it to your nearest and dearest um remember the grandmother test um is that if you're uh, and we'll get onto this if your grandmother can't um uh understand it then you there's no reason to assume why um anyone else including our judges would even though they do know the water sector um so remember to take that into uh, account now we call them this next one the tweet rule um it's very easy because we are asking you to, you know, broadly put your stuff into prose, even though, as we'll get onto, we like bullet points. Um, we, we, it's very easy for people to get bogged down in, in, in really long sentences. And I think it's spectacularly unnecessary. One of the great things about Twitter before it went from 140 to 280 characters is that 140 characters is a remarkably useful, um, you know, science of getting yourself into a place where you can have a cogent thought very, very, very briefly. Um, and just see what happens to your writing when you limit your ca uh, sentences to less than 140 characters. I almost guarantee you that the quality of your writing is going to go up, the engagement is going to go up, the urgency is going to go up. Um, I, this is one that I think is a, stylistically is a very, very useful thing um, to, uh, to take into account whenever you are doing anything. If you see a sentence that really runs on, chances are that you are not going to be the only person that notices that, so cut them up. The other one, and I'll see if I can find it for all of you, is that um, writing is a little bit like music. Um, so, you know, when, when, really great, uh, when really great music is written, there are kind of variations in, you know, tempos and themes and the melody is going, you know, up and around and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, varying the length of your sentences um, and the uh, and kind of the cadence of what you have written down just makes the writing that more engaging. Um, I'll see if I can find, as I said, I'll see if it, I'll see if I can find this particular graphic um, that I saw the other day. But I'd never thought about it like this before. But really varying the length of your sentences to get your point across makes the writing much much more engaging. And remember that the engagement is key because these judges are busy. By the time they get to about the eighth application, they are going to be slightly resenting this idiot Tom who asked them again to become a member of the judging panel and they've got a million things to do, but they promised Tom that they would do this and oh my God, I can't like handle it. So the easier you can make it through your style, the better. Okay, jargon kills. It doesn't quite, but it does kill some applications. Now, some technical language, it's especially in the solution description of the application, you can't really kind of get away with not including it. And that is where we allow you 1500 glorious characters to just go nuts with all of the technical elements that you really need to. Now, I advise you to minimize the technical elements for everybody's sake. But if you are really wading into jargon, jargon words, and I would include the word um, disruptive here, um, as, unless, of course, you have really re read and understood um, the innovator's dilemma and are using it with a, in a way that has uh, real explanatory, explanatory power, um, then just really watch out. When you are using words that you, it is unlikely that your grandmother, um, this wonderful lady coming back to, coming back to um, uh, the conversation once again, um, that your grandmother wouldn't understand, just really watch out. You might think that it sounds super smart and businessy or technical or whatever it is, um, an insidery, and so we think that you know what you're talking about. The, the curve of understanding goes from don't know anything and sort of can't express it, and then it, it, yes, you do know a lot, but you can only express it in kind of technical or jargony terms, but people who really understand what they're doing can express it in very, very, very simple terms. Um, so just watch out uh, for uh, watch out for the jargon. Um, and if you're, you don't know whether what you're saying counts as jargon, just ask me. <laughs> um, Okay, um, so we give you characters, um, and most people, um, you have put, you know, a nice block of prose in there. That is basically fine. Um, I would say, and 
I would say for the, for this, and not every um, organization that has an application form will um, even allow you to do bullets. I think bullet points are your friend. Um, I think there are always things that you want to cover um, in a in a uh, in a um, in an efficient manner, and bullets are the best way to do it. Um, especially if you are doing something like your go-to-market plan, which has um, you probably want to include four or five brief statements of information, um, like who, how, where, when, etc. Um, just have them as a list, and then you know we can say literally tick it off in our minds um, and say, yeah, absolutely, you've 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 are oh, you've clearly you know thought about this, and this seems like a reasonable way of getting your um, your product into the hands of the people who who need it. Um, so remember that bullets are there to be used. You do not just need to use a block of text. So, um, we, um, I, you know, as I've, as I've already said, we, we really want to demystify this process. Um, there's a reason why we don't just say, give me a business plan. Um, because one, it's a total nightmare for us. But secondly, we, over time, we've seen, you know, in, even since I've been doing this, since, uh, since uh, April 2015, um, I've seen probably over a thousand companies uh, now, and one of the things that really separates the best from the others is that is that they really do the basics well. You know, they've really they've really zeroed in on a on a problem. They've followed the outline that we have given to you. And what I mean by the breadcrumbs is that yeah, like you use the pointers that we give you in the application to sort through the information that we want versus the information that we that we don't want. Um, and you know, and it really goes to this kind of ability to learn. This um, this the, this Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon is that, like, you know, Susie is just <laughs> Susie's like trying to you know figure out the previous chapter before she goes on to the new chapter, so she has this basis of knowledge to be able to to go on, right? Um, you know, that ability to say, okay, I can use this as a building block for me to look at the kind of the next thing. That shows us that you have a willingness to essentially kind of not necessarily follow instructions, but just learn from things that are relatively basic to be able to improve your own performance. And that's what we're really looking for for people within the accelerator is the people who can engage in our uh, everything from our in-person sessions with people like Steve Close at um, True North Venture Partners all the way to our, uh, you know, our 11 or 12 um, webinar sessions where we cover all sorts of things to be able to really integrate this into what they already know rather than go, huh, all right, and then just carry on with what they were doing, uh, you know, um, uh, previously. So that's why we look for people who are able to to do the basics well because I promise if you follow the little gray bullet points you're gonna write something excellent now um, not many people would say uh, ignore the best um, uh, business person uh, you know um, possibly in the history of um, a hem business um, but we call this the ignore the Henry Ford uh, ignore Henry Ford rule um, he famously said if I had asked people what they wanted they would have said faster horses and then people also jumped to that wonderful um uh example of uh you know the paragon of um uh silicon valley whatever um steve jobs um who also you said you know the, uh, the, if um uh, if i'd asked people what they wanted i never would have given them the iphone you know um we fundamentally kind of disagree with this. There is part, there is a possibility that one of you out there on this webinar um, listening to this is going to invent the iPhone of water. I dearly hope that is the case, um, but we think it's far, far, far more likely that great businesses in water are going to be built in direct response to a problem. Um, and it may be a problem that people don't know they had, but you can really triangulate those problems by going to ask people about their day to day. And this could be anything from, you know, compliance to I don't have enough data to this king thing keeps on breaking to my filtration process is too slow or I'm using too much energy or like my over my board oversight is getting so ridiculous. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to um, get my rate rise, whatever it might be. We think that data matters and we've actually slightly adjusted the application form this year um, uh, to really say that you know to give a, an advantage to people who have gone out and collected primary data it doesn't necessarily be for and need to be from their customers but we do want to see results of interviews because when you go on your ability your proven ability to go and talk to and work with your customers is going to be a massive unfair advantage and if you don't do it you can be sure that your competitors will if not now eventually 
And so really making sure that you get into this habit of getting primary data early is really important. So yes, please, everyone, ignore Henry Ford. So if you'd ask people at the end of the uh, season before last, or maybe the season before that on the English Premier League, um, whether or not Leicester had a hope in hell of winning it, um, I think they were 500 to one um, to get it because over 38 uh, games in um, a soccer season in the UK, um, really the you know quality does kind of will out and nobody would have looked at the group of players that Leicester had and said that they had any uh any hope at all but they you know in, in a little bit like the whole um, moneyball situation they took together um a bunch of people who were more than the sum of their parts and so when we talk about your team we I, I don't want you to read anything into the fact that we put team down at section I think it's eight or nine we do not think it's eight or ninth most important so please do show us whether it's in a slide deck in the investor presentation um, sorry it's a slide in the investor presentation um, and or just really use those characters in the team side of things to show us that these are people working uh, working together um, working together to be you know more than the sum of their parts to be able to achieve this kind of common goal because it is super important and this is partially what we're going to be focusing on in the interviews as well is the is the is the why and the how you are this group of people that are the people to get this job done now on the previous webinar um, we top touched on this a little bit and I am going to bring up that um, uh, that same diagram in, in just a second um, this is a little bit dark but please identify your beachhead um, you know, there is a reason why, you know, the allies in, on D-Day focused on that little tiny corner of northwestern France, um, is that if you can just establish yourself in a, in a, with an initial stronghold, you are in very, very, very good shape. Um, and so when we talk about segmentation and focus and all the rest of it, we do not do this lightly. This, again, this comes from looking at thousands of companies. Um, this is really, really, really important for you to say, no, I'm going to focus on North America or the Americas or like Western Europe or whatever. We are looking for a, uh, a very specific um, uh, group of people that you are going to be uh, working with. So quick questions just come on. Come on. Um, and this is about the, the previous slides, uh, good primary data. Uh, thank you, uh, Young. So um, I almost don't care whether or not it's quote unquote good. I just really would like to see uh, primary data. And by primary data, I just mean the results of conversations with people that are in your market. Um, now, you maybe not be able to give us the full results, but as long as, you know, if you can say conducted 100 interviews and this has led us to focus on, you know, XYZ market rather than YXZ market, then that is going to be good enough for me. Honestly, any primary data is good at this point. Um, uh, and so, you know, if you can quote to me really like, you know, uh, accurate statistics that back up your um, whatever you're saying in any given section um, that comes straight from the, the, the you know, the, the horse's mouth, as it were, then that's great. Uh, but I promise you that, um, you know, getting any primary data in there is going to be a good thing and also an outsized advantage. So I hope that I hope that helps. Um, but just on the uh, on the beachhead thing, the last thing that I will say is um, is for the segment is that you're looking for a group of people that share a common problem and experience that problem so acutely that they are willing to pay for an imperfect solution now to solve at least some of that pain, and ideally that those people talk to each other. So if I can say that again verbatim. So you're looking for a group of group of people, hopefully that talk to each other, that share a common problem and experience that problem so acutely that they are willing to pay for an imperfect solution now to solve at least some of that pain. Um, I hope you can go back to this recording and listen to that over and over again, because I think it's one of the most important sentences um, out there kind of in, uh, in entrepreneurship. That is what you are looking for. That is hopefully where a lot of your primary data, at least initially, is going to be focusing, uh, focusing on. Um, there's a question here which usually comes up. Thank you, Lorenzo. Can primary data come from studies done by third parties such as academic papers? Yeah, that's fine. Um, it, you know, a lot of that is going to come go into presumably your market sizing uh, and uh, various other elements. Um, it's not ideal because 
there is there really is no substitute for having been in front of a person who is experiencing the problem that you are trying to solve and understanding exactly what their world looks like because it's not just about a product right it's about how you're going to deploy it how you're going to surface it how you're going to make sure that they're having a wildly good customer experience how you're going to be able to get feedback over time so you can iterate quickly right and you don't get that without having been able to establish a relationship with the person who's hopefully going to become one of your uh, your primary users and you can't get that from academic papers. The data is great, but really what's great is the fact that you've shown us that you've gone out and done the legwork, um, and uh, done the legwork to be able to, you know, really establish these relationships now, which shows us that you are likely to be, carry on doing the legwork as you try and build your business's business while you're in Imagine H2O. So it's, it's both a question of the data that comes out of it, but also a signaling of your behavior as an entrepreneur that points to us that says that, yeah, this is somebody that really gets it, that is going to stay engaged with their target market, especially while they are they are building um, building the initial product. So I hope that um, uh, that helps. Thanks for the question, Lorenzo. Um, and so um, and remember this is that what you're looking for when you're getting that you know primary data and you're out there in the market you're looking really for the pioneers who are going to take your take on your uh, product and you'll always be able to find some pioneers um, what you're trying to find is a group of pioneers that you can kind of dominate that you can get to kind of 40 to 50 percent of the market um, and then you can move into the early adopters um, that are going to need your thing for a slightly different reason and they also have a slightly different reason for buying it but nonetheless, you're expanding your you're expanding your revenue um, with this uh, pioneer and early adopters uh, segment. And, and once you get to there, you're going to be probably wanting to pour the petrol on the fire. Um, and so you're going to be increasing your cash burn, and then you know you're going to have high expectations not only from of, you know presumably and but hopefully not investors. Uh, we love it when companies don't want to meet investors because they want to um, bootstrap. We think that's the best thing ever. Um, but if you do have investors, that's the time when there's the highest expectations. You'll probably have raised a Series A or a Series B, um, and you will you will have locked yourself into a set of expectations from a group of um, well, I call them external. Some people call them internal stakeholders um, to get into this late adopters market when you have your max cash burn. And so the timing of those late adopters and the the quality of your insight about who those late adopters are going to be is really, really, really important. Um, and that really comes from Thinking clearly, but thinking clearly enough to identify your pioneers and how you're going to get into the hands of the pioneers and then into the early adopters really does de-risk that, um, the, de the fact that you may or that you may not be thinking well enough to get into the hands of the late adopters. As you manage each transition, the way in which you think about it is is really important, especially in terms of external signaling to um, uh, to people who are going to be uh, you know watching your progress. So finding your markets, especially through primary data, is really important. Okay, so we're gonna take you. Ooh, um, so we're gonna take you as we say it, under the wig. Um, I come from a very strange country. I mean, what is what is with these um, people dressed up as, up as Santa Claus? I have many friends who actually have to wear those um, uh, wigs to work. Isn't that the weirdest thing? So quickly, um, uh, Niels, thank you. For that. This is a really good question. What is the difference between an investor deck and a pitch deck? And do we assume that the investors are familiar with the water industry? So the difference between an investor deck and a pitch deck is a pitch deck is going to be on a screen behind you while you are talking about the content of it. Um, the pitch deck will have much less granular information within it. You have to assume that the investor deck is going to be on the desk of an investor. You are not going to be in the room and you are not going to be on the phone and you are not going to be in front of a slide deck to, it, to um, explain anything to them, which means means that yes you may be a you are okay to be able to um, uh, provide a little bit more density of information on the slides not too much nobody everybody but I promise you everybody prefers to see a visual explanation of what you are trying to do rather than bullet points and paragraphs written on slide decks I promise you um, and so the difference between an investor deck and a pitch deck is a pitch deck should basically have no words on it. 
um, an investor deck, there's got to be like quite a lot more granular information on there, but both of them really are visual. And about the assumption that the investors are familiar with the water industry, everybody in our judging group is going to be familiar with the water industry, much, much more than any other program uh, in the world. That said, they're not going to know everything about everything. You're going to have some people who are really, you know, stuck into the kind of the, the utility software side of things. And so if you, we, we try and pair by um uh we try and pair by uh by expertise so people who know mem membranes are going to see the membranes ones and people who know filtration are going to see the filtration one and people who know data are going to see the data ones um and so you can sort of assume that there are people who are going to really know the kind of the ins and outs but again you should be able to explain your business in pretty simple terms um it's, and and for it to remain compelling um, in the solution description, if you need to get onto, you know, statistics about, you know, whatever, uh, flux or the way in which your algorithms work or whatever it might be, then that's absolutely fine. Um, if you're ever in doubt, just check with me. Um, but just because the investors are familiar with the water industry, please do not use that as an excuse for you to sort of wa wander off into uh, into kind of into water industry um, or your section of the water industry jargon um, when actually the exercise is really about making this as simple as uh, as simple as possible. So I hope that helps. Good question, Niels. Thank you, um, Susan. Um, since you've said to use the Guy Kawasaki format, but we need to include more info, does this mean we can bypass the 30 point font rule to use four to, or smaller fonts and get more info in there? This is actually a really important question and I do apologize that you've had to ask it. Yes, ignore the 30 point font rule. Um, like the Guy Kawasaki, we just, we just want to get away. The reason we use that is we just want to get away from people who just don't cover about 40 percent of what needs to be covered in an investor deck. And just the Guy Kawasaki format is just it's, it's the basics of what we uh, of, of the structure that we expect. Please ignore the 30 point font rule. And remember that you do. Please do not include your uh, cover and uh, cover slide and thank you slide. Um, as part of the 10, uh, as part of the 10 um, slides, so you actually can use 12. Um, uh, when we work with you on your investor pitch, customer decks, you are probably going to end up with um, a, a longer deck and probably quite a different format from Guy Kawasaki's, but it just gives us a basis to work from, and it, it just ensures, you know, in a little bit of the way that the business model canvas does, it ensures that you're thinking about all of the key elements of the argument that you need to make. Um, so yes, Susan, great question. Sorry I hadn't addressed it, but please don't um, uh, use the 30-point font um, in an investor deck because it's going to get pretty weird pretty quickly. Um, Camilo, um, as engineers and people from the water sector, graphics is not our strength. How important is it to have an amazing deck in terms of graphics? Hola indeed, Camilo. Um, how is it important to have an amazing deck in terms of graphics? Now, look, this is not a graphics competition right this is not we're not going to select people on the basis of their graphics we're going to select people on the basis of the quality of their thought around their business as well as what we regard as the commercial potential as well as the impact of that um uh, of that company on a given uh, area of um uh of uh the water sector okay so it's not vital um to have great graphics going on but what i would say is that you know we do not have an in-house design person and hopefully you've seen our um hopefully you've seen our um uh well whatever it is the design of you know these slide decks is incredibly simple um uh, but also our collateral that we've sent out to you. Um, all of it's designed all of it's clean um you know it's we think it's relatively well organized and we just use upwork um, very, 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 very cost effective. And remember, like the graphics that you do for this, hopefully will be graphics that you can use in every presentation from now on. So regardless of Imagine H2O, if this can be a forcing mechanism for you to really nail like the look and feel of your deck. Like I wish it wasn't important and we, we try and you know minimize it. I wish it wasn't important, but I promise you, for investors that see 3,000 to 4,000 companies a year, if you're giving them something kind of just a bit janky and weird, you're giving them a reason not to take you seriously, all right?
and you are in the business of minimizing the amount of reasons that people would uh, not take you seriously. So I would seriously consider whether you have a friend who can do graphics or whether you can get onto Upwork or, you know, there are a bunch of platforms that can do this stuff. We think it's a really, really worthwhile use of time. So I'm going to pause the questions for a second. Please do keep them coming in. Um, and we are going to go under the wig. Um, so we, we're not going to go. Um, this is uh, something that came into our um, urban drinking water challenge. Um, this is just all of the initial uh, initial um, information. The first time that you are judged by a judge is the elevator pitch. Uh, and what we evaluate on is the quality of the pitch. And notice that it's not very granular. Um, we just want to know the point of an elevator pitch is to pique someone's curiosity. And so if you pique their curiosity, you're going to get five. If you're clear and you really want to and you make them want to hear more. What I say about the elevator pitch is please include two, if not three reasons why people should sit up and take notice. Um, we'll go through this for those who who get it. Uh, we'll get into imagination where we go through this um, uh, process of the slide decks. But in the opening of a slide, when you have the, you know, the logo just up, we ask people to open with three pieces of information that force everybody to put down their iPhones and pay the goddamn attention to what you are about to say. It's the it's the kind of the the um, the equivalent of grabbing people by the the front of their shirt and forcing them to pay attention. Make sure that you open with a bang in the brief elevator pitch for the companies. The investor deck. We just talked about that a little bit. Upload now the content. Um, you know, we want to uh, make sure that um, that you're providing a granular and information, clear arguments and evidence to get a second meeting with an investor. What we, the bar that you are looking for to hurdle over is that the investor is going to say yes, please, to getting you in to come and pitch in person. So you're trying to build something that's going to be a strong enough uh, argument on the on the table. So, and then in terms of the story and the design, um, Camilo, to your question, um, you know, we are, when, you know, this is not a design competition, but what we're looking for is a narrative arc. Like, are you taking us through a story that we think is really compelling within the water sector? Do we think that the content that you've chosen to include is insightful? And frankly, is the, pro is the presentation professional? Um, and by that we mean um, a professional presentation is going to be the opposite of imprecise and rushed, okay? You're just showing us that you've taken the time with this to really craft it because it's irrelevant, Imagine H2O, totally irrelevant, right? You, it would be great to get in, that's fine, but if you can do this for us, this now you now have this for investors or customers and frankly the most importantly your key hires that you're going to get on that you can put this in front of them and say this is what we are trying to do now the video we always get a lot of questions about this um we are not looking for people who um we're not going to get any prizes for cinematography or editing or whatever it is um what we are looking for is a video that covers the problem being solved, the description of the value proposition and the product, and the progress of the company so far in a clear and logical manner. I will say that again. I just want to cover, I want you to cover the problem being solved, the description of the value proposition, and the product you're creating, and the progress of the company so far in a clear and logical manner. This can be you talking to camera. This can be you sitting next to a um, uh, an open laptop going through the slide deck um, uh, to be uh, to basically go through the story. Um, that is absolutely fine. If you want to do something that's a bit more out there in the world, that's also totally fine. Um, but what we the second one I think is more is really more important is that we are looking for exceptional communicators. Um, this is one of the areas in which companies have an outsize advantage, sorry, a clearly unfair advantage. And this is something that I really wish wasn't true and something that I did not appreciate when I first started doing this. But an ability of someone to communicate and pitch brilliantly is an unfair advantage in that they can explain their company brilliantly, which is gonna be underpin their abilities both as a leader of their teams, getting people engaged and crucially recruiting people, but also recruiting customers, as well as being able to be a great fundraiser 
you know, do things like access uh, non-dilutive capital, all the rest of it. So we're looking for content and communication. So the video can be very, very simple indeed. And you're going to get um, a, uh, um, comments um, from the uh, judges um, for the uh, for section A uh, here. So problem definition, only 800 char characters for this. So we want, we're judging you on the quality of your identification of the problem. Is there a clear, large and growing urgent market need? And now we have the problem verification. This is slightly different from what we had last year. Is that we are looking for an impressive range of input on the problem with multiple interviews completed. So if you do not include any primary or secondary data in this, it's gonna be very difficult for you to be up this end and you're much more likely to be on this end, um, on the, the one side of things. Um, and nobody wants to be on the one side of things. All right, but the problem identification is crucial. We think that the we think that the companies with the highest um, potential are the ones where there is someone deeply miserable that is being built for. Um, and just a reminder here: so things like the solution description, you've got fifteen hundred characters here to go over, right? But you have got four bullet points to cover. So we want you to describe the product or service, making it clear how it solves the problem you describe in part four, making that link explicit. We want you to make sure you include your product's advantage over existing products or solutions that can be price, performance, whatever it might be. We want you to we want to understand that you've whether or not you've validated that it works or if not, how you will how you will validate it. Um, and remember that this is like we do not want to penalize people who are earlier stage. Um, so, you know, you don't have to have validated everything um, completely already. Um, but we do want to know what your plans for validation are because it's the quality of your thought around things like this that are going to differentiate you uh, as an entrepreneur that we think is going to be uh, is going to do well in Imagine H2O. And so there are three um, uh, 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 verticals that you are judged on here. Product description, we just want a clear, crisp, detailed explanation of the product. Um, and you can be detailed while being brief. OK, do not think uh, you're all going to get um, uh, frustrated at the uh, the character counts. Um, that's fine. Um, it's actually a really useful exercise to go through in terms of being able to really get the core pieces of information across very, very efficiently. Um, so secondly, remember, look at validation. You can get a five by including a clear, logical explanation of the path of validation. Yes. It's easier if you've got clear validation that product works as advertised, and that's usually that it's been working with a, a, a customer or a pilot customer or in the home or at the bench or whatever it is. Um, but a logical explanation of the path of validation is, is what we're looking for. And then product differentiation. We really do want you to engage the other solutions that are out there. And please do this seriously. You can say everyone, everyone else is rubbish, that's fine. Um, if you make the statement that there are no competitors, revisit the statement that the, you have no competitors and then delete it and write something else. Everybody always has competitors. If there is nobody else offering what you are offering, then your competition is the status quo. All right. So how are you going to be better than what is out there at the moment? And I promise you, one of the biggest faux pas that people get into is saying that you have no um, uh, competition and my being able to say, actually, there are three other uh, companies out there doing something relatively similar um, uh, and you just not knowing about them. So if you're going to make a statement like that, one, you shouldn't. Two, if you really want to, then make sure that you uh, that you back it up. Um, yeah, and then you're going to have more, you're going to have another set of comments here for this uh, this, this second, uh, second section. Beachhead Market, again, does this look familiar? I've already said it twice, I don't need to say it again, but this is the beachhead segment. We really want you to focus in on it, right? And again, primary data is strongly encouraged. And so we're looking for the logical selection of a target market that will allow the company to deploy limited resources effectively and build an initial customer base. This is not your whole customer base. This is not where you are gonna spend all of your time. We are looking for you to identify an, an initial customer base. And don't worry about it. You will, have your, you will have your overall market slide in your investor deck that's gonna tell us you know, how many billions are at stake and, and all the rest of it. What we want is something really focused that can get you realistically to about 500, to a, a million, 500 grand to a million dollars within about 18 months of your selection uh, for Imagine H2O, realistically, all right? And it's a pretty doable target for most of you. Um, uh, so make sure that you've got that logical selection there. And then in terms of the market dynamics, um, overall, 
uh, we want to know that you're going par after a large growing and underserved initial target market. Um, and by large, look, it, large is not a billion dollars, right? Large is kind of, there's maybe a $10 million prize here or a $20 million prize, right? But the dynamics, hopefully what we want to see is that the problem within this beachhead market is getting tougher and tougher. Now that might be through regulation or price or climate change or whatever the hell it is, um, you know, lack of access to talent, whatever it might be. Um, but this, this, uh, there is an advantage for people whose initial markets are growing because it's great to be involved with a, uh, a growing market because the numbers are just on your side. Um, and then in terms of the willingness and the ability to pay, we really do need to know that the um, uh, that the people who do um, uh, who do who are going to be the targets for you they have the budget agency and need for the solution um, go to market plan I've got to speed up slightly um, so you're going to be judged on your marketing and visibility um, we want to know that you understand the customer's discovery process how the hell do they get new stuff into their hands like what is going to be your relevant methods of approach to um to uh, basically intersect with that discovery process and what are the value propositions that you are going to highlight to them that are going to resonate all right now channel strategy now most of you are going to be going direct um that's good um, if you're doing a hybrid strategy, um, I hope you've got a good explanation for it. Um, that's why we've said logical selection of one, maybe two channels that are a strong fit for both the product and the target customer. So just make sure that you are uh, just justifying your choice. And then the sales cycle. Um, most uh, most accelerators, you know, YC, 500 startups, whatever, um, they will look at your sales cycle and be a bit confused as to how anyone can build a business. We do not care. If you are saying that it's 12 months or 24 months, um, that's fine. We've worked with custom companies that have sales cycles that are longer than that. What you need is a credible approach to managing that sales cycle. So hopefully you can have a sales cycle that's one month or less. Almost all of you will have it that's a lot longer than that. So just make sure that you are clear about how you're going to manage that sales cycle. Now, the economics side of things. Remember to follow the breadcrumbs here, okay? Um, uh, you will wonder why it's a 200 characters less than the problem. It's because we don't set a huge amount of store by it. Just make sure that this is uploaded. Um, there is a template there. Just follow the template. It's very, very simple. Um, but what we're really looking for is uh, pricing, ROI, and customer acquisition. Note that rate of revenue ramp is not in here. You can tell us you know, that you're going to be uh, an explosive growth company. That's fine. Um, we think that the quality uh, of your um, explanation of your pricing um, and the uh, the ROI that um, accrues both to you and to your customer is a much much better indicator of revenue um, of future revenue than you know what you're going to say in terms of your overall revenue numbers. Um, the ROI really wants to be evidently attractive to a potential customer, so please let us know that it is attractive to a potential customer. And then the other thing, and this is partially, um, you know, looking forwards um, in that your customer acquisition cost when you are early is going to be very, very high. Um, that is fine. What we want to make sure is that you are engagement, engaging in this idea of the customer acquisition cost and tracking it early. Because engaging in customer acquisition cost means that you are thinking about your unit economics from the start. And we think that especially water businesses really need to keep an eye on unit economics from the start. Impact risking team, um, you've got even more characters here uh, for that. Um, the uh, integration with SDG6, you can just um, look up SDG6 if you've forgotten what it is, but what we're looking at is the impact and the scalability of impact. So a compelling case for positive impact on sustainable resource management, and then a compelling case that, that that solution can scale with the team and business model to deliver. Risk assessment, we talked about this a little bit last time, but what we're looking at is risk identification and risk mitigation. Please take this seriously. The larger risks you can identify, the better. Um, please just engage with it. And then the team, down at section number 11. So the current team, the gap analysis, and the advisors. The reason we ask for advisors is that they're a really good way of filling in the gaps and also cheap way of filling in the gaps. But what we're looking for is exceptional talent that is well equipped to ta tackle the technical and commercial challenges of the business. Now, usually the gap analysis is quite brief. That's fine. We just want to know who you're hiring next. Um, because there are things like, you know, if you're hiring salespeople, before marketing people, then that's something that we, it's probably gonna come up in the interview. We think that usually marketing needs to come first um, before salespeople. That's something that can be um, 
uh, that can be debated for at length. Um, uh, you know, um, are you know, are you bringing on more engineers, whoever it is? Um, are you actually bringing on business people at the right stage of the uh, company, whatever it might be? And then the advisors, people who can fill in the gaps. And then you're going to see overall comments. And then the judge is going to save. And then when we open up, um, uh, when we open up the applications um, for, uh, when we open up the applications for. Um, uh, for you to take a look at, you will be able to see all of the comments as well as the scores. Um, and so if I just go back to my uh, judging dashboard, um, hang on, I don't know why that isn't going back. So if I save that, it'll take me back. So you'll see they'll have their, what's it? Um, okay, and then this is, they'll have, you know, nine more pending evaluations and now the water room has gone into the completed evaluation. So going quickly back to our uh, slide deck here. Remember this, team problem, primary data, beachhead market, iterative approach to building a solution, financing and operations, right? Those are the elements of a successful water startup. So make sure that you keep an eye on those. Just quickly, make it as easy as you can for the judges. That means that your writing should be good. So write well, remember the tweet rule. Um, please go through multiple drafts, save often. Please draft offline so you don't have to save often. Um, the production in values in the video in the, in, the, in the video do not matter. Remember the investor deck is not a pitch deck. You can get info density. Please don't use 30 point font. Um, uh, give us a little bit more granular information, but if each slide is covered in words, then that's probably not going to be great. Um, uh, watch out for saying that you're going to have a 1.5 billion, billion valuation in five years. Um, it may be possible. Uh, we are yet to see it, and we are nine years into doing this, uh, 10 years next year. Um, and so we want people who are going to be realistic about the, uh, the trajectory of growth, because growth is going to be sticky. You can build fantastic businesses in this business, but it is usually more often than not relatively slow. I hope this year we are going to have multiple businesses that are going to show me why I am wrong. Um, please get it in early. Um, you are going to get feedback. Uh, everybody is going to get feedback. Um, and if you have traction, this is one thing. Please make sure the voice of the customer is heard. Um, just including kind of one quote from a customer is remarkably effective. Um, you can you drop it into your pitch deck. Um, in fact, if you haven't already dropped it into your pitch deck, you really should. Um, wowing the customer early is a really, really good um, uh, indicator of future success. And then please do use us. Blog, one-on-one -on -one sessions, email, and please watch the recording. So we have a couple of questions here to cover off. I can see that regarding to sales cycle, that the shorter, the higher the grade, not necessarily. Um, we really, we'd love to see the fact that people have got a really short sales cycle because it means that they can grow fast. But given that you, if, but if you have a long sales cycle, we just need to see a salient plan for managing that long sales cycle. I hope that's clear, Niels. In the uh, five, you're not just going to get five if you only have less than a one month sales cycle. Right. You can get five by saying I've got a 24 month sales cycle, but this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to stack the um, I've already got a pipeline of whatever, 200 qualified leads um, out of those. I think, you know, we're going to take half of them towards, uh, you know, um, uh, a forward over the next 12 months. So I think I can get three or four closed um, within 12 months. But mostly this is going to be an 18 to 12, month, 18 to 24 month sales cycle. And that means I need to make sure that I'm conserving cash. All right. I mean, it's pretty like relatively simple, but you're you can still get the highest grade by showing the, about the, the management. So the investment deck can be a PowerPoint or it can be a um, a, uh, a PDF. That's fine. Um, please do. Not, so the, the question is, it, it does it need to be organized like a PowerPoint or can it also be a Word document like an executive summary? We have it once. Um, allowed people, someone to get away with a Word document. The judges did not like it. Please have it included as a PowerPoint structure. Um, if you feel like, there, if Igor, you feel like there is a, a good um, reason for it being in a, a, a Word document, um, we can have that discussion, but please make sure we have that discussion. We really do want to see it in slide deck form. Um, due to travel meeting with customers, I can't get it in early. Is there a level field resubmission date? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, whenever you get it in, you will be equally considered. Um, Mike, if you, uh, you know, want to talk about, um, uh, anything to do with this, then that's absolutely fine. Um, but whenever you get it in, there is absolutely a level playing field. Igor, um, and how is a video different from a pitch? So it's the investor pitch deck and the video really should be a pitch. Yeah. 
um, you can go back to the recording and see the the four areas that I've asked you to to um, focus on with the video. Um, we really just want you to articulate the problem, um, the solution, the value proposition that you are creating against that problem, your progress so far, um, and then your quality as a communicator. Um, and so literally it can be incredibly simple, just phoning it, like videoing it on your smartphone, um, you know, going through a few slides on a TV or on a laptop or, or whatever it might be. Laura, um, should we submit the application before our one-to-one -one session? Can we edit the application after submission? Yes and yes. Um, I can get access to the application before the one-to-one -one session without you submitting it, um, but there is no uh, disadvantage to submitting it. After you've submitted it, you can carry on editing up, up until midnight on November the 1st. All you have to do is uh, save. All right, um, and it really does help me if I can uh, see it through our um, through our portal, um, uh, which only happens after you've submitted it. Otherwise, I need to go back into the back end of our tool and download things as a CSV, and it is boring. Um, and so, if you can submit the application before our one-to-one -one session, please do. Um, Lorenzo, to clarify, it has to be ten slides only. This is the investor deck. Please limit your content slides to 10 slides. So we do not count the cover slide and the closing slide um, because the cover slide should be kind of, you know, just, you know, welcoming your logo and who's gonna pitch and whatever. And then the closing slide is, is, is really your, your um, contact details and, uh, and any kind of pithy final statement you want to make. But it's 10 slides of content. If you go over 10 slides of content, you should have a, in fact, there is no no reason to. Um, and actually we've ex explicitly been asked by our judges to make sure it's limited to 10 slides of content. Because when you multiply um, extra slides by the amount of uh, people who are going to be applying, you get a vastly um, uh, exponentially scaling um, uh, uh, content, uh, um, volume of information and really the judges like really want to make sure that this is as, uh, as streamlined as, as possible. So please adhere to the 10, 10 slides um, on pain of, well, something painful, I suppose. Um, Camilo, regarding the financial model, may I, may I modify it or stick to your format? Please do not modify it. Please stick to our format. There is a reason why we want this as simple as we put it in there. If you want to discuss this, that's fine. But we really don't care that much about actually what you think that your revenue projections are, are going to be. Um, broadly, they all kind of look the same. Um, and we think that just having a broken down version of the uh, of the um, uh, the the um, income statement um, with the key ratios um, in terms of what your margins, what you think your margins are going to be, um, as well as the uh, explanation of the ROI and then a quick look at the customer acquisition cost, having something projected out over time is really what we need to see. Um, and so if people start modifying it and putting in super slick Excel spreadsheets, suddenly we don't know where to look at, to, we don't know where to look to find our key ratios against which we really want to just get an idea of how you think the financial health of the company is going to go. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have got really slick Excel spreadsheets and it's going to suck not using them because they are, you know, they have all sorts of macros and cool stuff going on. Um, we 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 really think that the um, the predictors of uh, success as a an early stage company um, lie elsewhere. So if there are no more questions, we've we've run five minutes over, and I want to make sure that I'm respectful of your time. Um, again, there's a reason why I'm repeating this. Build this, test it, learn about it, then refine it. Build it, test it, learn about it, then refine it. This is as true for your product as it is for your application form. So please make sure that you do it. Give yourself time to iterate against the uh, the initial uh, initial application. Um, so one more question regarding the content on the investor deck. I got confused. Should we include things like who have we talked to, with whom we have validated our data, etc.? Yes, please. Please do include things like that um, because you're going to be making a lot of statements about why you think this is a great opportunity out there in the market. Um, and if you've validated this with primary data or you've had the data validated about the performance of your solution by an external third party, whatever it might be, please do um, please do incorporate uh, incorporate that. So um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to um, leave you there. I'm just going to say thank you all for being here. I'm sorry for taking you slightly over time. I really appreciate you giving up this hour um, and engaging so well in this process. Um, you are you are all um, very much appreciated by me and the the team here at Imagine H2O, and we cannot wait. 
to see what you've got in store for us. We look forward to hearing from you and to seeing your applications, but for now, so long.